many gardeners just resist rotating their crops. They just avoid it like the plague. And here's what I've been told by many gardeners. It's complicated. It's way too complicated. And it's a hassle. So today we're going to define crop rotation. We're going to discover the advantages of crop rotation. And we're going to go through some examples of crop rotation. Now, if I've done my job right, you guys, you're going to come away with ideas for how you can put it to work in your garden. So let's dive in. So crop rotation, by the way, it's nothing new. It's one of agriculture's oldest cultural practices with roots, pardon the pun, that stretch back to ancient times. Now, crop rotation simply means that you change where you plant or sow your vegetables. It's primarily about vegetables in the garden each season. So why is crop rotation so important? Well, it's used to manage soil health and tilth, which is a fancy name for or term for texture, and to reduce damage from pests and diseases. Now, I'm going to say that again because crop rotation is used to manage soil health, tilth, right, and to reduce damage from pests and diseases. So let me tell you a story about my friend Midge. If you're on the fence about crop rotation, listen to the story about Midge. Now, you'd really like Midge. She lives off the grid on a remote island in Alaska. And she gardens on a steep, and I mean steep, hillside. Here she is explaining to my organic gardening students how to grow garlic in raised beds. These are impressive raised beds. She built these herself. And right here is a big, what's reusing or repurposing a salt bag, like holding salt that you'd put on streets for the winter. It's full of leaves and leaf mold. Midge grew amazing garlic, selling her like large, really zesty flavored bulbs to eager gardeners far and wide, or eager cooks far and wide. So yeah, it's, that's really what it was. It's gardener cooks far and wide. All was well until one day she noticed something odd about one of the plants. It was one plant and then another. It was like a fuzzy growth and, and then a spot here and there. Basically, Midge's garlic days were over. Years later, she says, I thought that since I mulched the beds with seaweed, leaves, and compost, that I could keep growing garlic in the same beds for years and years. And then she said, boy, was I wrong. So Midge's story is a common one with a common lesson. Crop rotation is real and it's necessary if you want a solid defense against pests and diseases. In other words, you know, you can get away with things as in, in gardening, right? But when it comes to planting the same thing in the same bed over and over, something's going to bite you one day. And we're going to talk about that. There's another story coming up. So when it comes to growing vegetables, crop rotation is what I call your secret BOT, your bag of tricks that no gardener should be without. And why is that? Because as you'll see, crop rotation does a lot of the heavy lifting for you. So hang on to those thoughts. We're going to explore five essential advantages of crop rotation. This is where you pull out your your, your paper and pen. Number one, you have fewer weeds to wrestle. That's a tongue twister. Fewer weeds to wrestle. So different crops can actually suppress or block different kinds of weeds, which means you'll spend less time playing tug of war with weeds. By switching up your crops, weeds lose their grip. That's right. By switching up your crops, weeds over time 
lose their grip. Number two, crop rotation boosts soil health. Now, different crops require different nutrients from the soil, and they return nutrients back into the soil in their own way. Now, this give and take exchange or relationship, as scientists are discovering more and more about every day, it helps improve and maintain healthy soil. Healthy soil is the foundation of gardening. You get it right and the rest is easy. Number three, crop rotation keeps bugs and diseases guessing. So rotating crops can actually break the life cycles of pests and diseases that are specific to certain crops. This reduces infestations and explosions or outbreaks. In other words, just when pests and diseases think they've got an easy, free meal, you switch things up. This is something that Midge now knows is crucial to her success. And for Midge, it also is very important because she grows a lot of her own food. Now, number four, better soil means less work. So if you've ever felt like you're digging in concrete or like solid clay, plants have different root systems that can help aerate your soil, keeping it nice and fluffy. Now, fluffy soil means it's easy to work in the garden and it's easier on your back and your knees, like no more aching back. And finally, number five, Holy harvests, Batman. <laughs> so by rotating where you sow and plant your veggies, you'll see healthier soil and fewer pest diseases. So crop rotation can lead to bumper crops, which means more food on the table and in the pantry. Plus, you'll have more control over what's in your food and you'll enjoy lower food costs. I don't know about you, but in my few decades of life on this planet, I have never seen food prices go down. I could be wrong. Now let's look at some examples of how crop rotation and how it works so you can enjoy the benefits of crop rotation in your garden and in your life. First, Crop rotation improves plant health by grouping together plant families and plants with similar nutritional needs. The groups are then rotated based on the availability of soil nutrients they need. Okay, let's do an example here. Even though tomatoes, peppers, eggplant, and potatoes don't look alike, they are kissing cousins in the same family, the nightshades or the solanaceae family. Now, tomatoes are prone to diseases like blossom and rot and mosaic virus. If you've grown tomatoes for a long time, you might have come across one or both of these. Potatoes, on the other hand, can suffer from potato scab and potato nematodes. Now, when it comes to nutrients for tomatoes and potatoes, here's where it gets really, really interesting. Now, both tomatoes and potatoes need nutrients like nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, calcium, but the quantity and the timing of what they need can differ. For example, Tomatoes might require more calcium during fruiting to prevent blossom end rot, while potatoes may require higher potassium for tuber or yeah, the tuber development. Okay, so differences in what plants need in the way of nutrition clearly shows us the importance of crop rotation because 
Planting the same crop in the same place year after year can deplete the soil of those specific nutrients that a crop uses most. Okay, so we're gonna look at um, different vegetable families. You can see how rotating your veggies is really important. It's key to like balancing your garden and neutralizing the diseases. Then we'll put it all together so you can decide what amount or form of crop rotation works best um, for your situation. Okay, let's start with the nightshade family. We talked a little bit about it. Solanaceae, tomatoes and peppers and potatoes and eggplants. So they are prone to several soil-borne diseases like early blight and verticillium wilt. I think early blight was what happened that caused the famine in Ireland. So rotating members of the nightshade family prevents these diseases from building up in the soil. Now, a rule of thumb here, never follow tomatoes after potatoes and vice versa. We'll cover this in a bit. Now you have the allium family, the onion family. This is your, it's, it's, it's more than you realize, really. Onion, garlic, leeks, shallots, chives. Now these plants tend to be a little less demanding on uh, nutrients in the soil, not needing to take up quite as many. However, they can be affected by onion maggots and a variety of fungal diseases. Now rotating the alliums then helps break the life cycle of these pests and it reduces the likelihood of soil-borne soil -borne diseases. Now we have the popular legume family or pea family, Fabiaceae. So these are peas and beans, legumes that um, we're all very familiar with from um, green peas to soybeans. Now legumes are really cool. They're unique because they have that ability to fix nitrogen in the atmosphere and enrich the soil. I just love that. Rotating them prevents the buildup of specific pests and diseases as well, like root rot. So, oh, I, want, I wanted to mention too that because they're able to fix the nitrogen in the soil, they help improve the fertility for the next crop that follows in the rotation. We'll talk about that. And then we have brassica or the cabbage family. This is big. Brassicas are an important family to many gardeners. Okay, broccoli, cauliflower, kale, Brussels sprouts. They are heavy feeders though. That means they consume a lot of nutrients from the soil. They draw up a lot of nutrients. They're also susceptible to club root and black rot, just to name two. So rotating the cabbage family helps manage these issues. Now, I mentioned club root here. I want to talk about club root because this is a very serious disease that affects plants in the cabbage family worldwide. Infected plants, uh, they look stunted and they wilt easily. If you have a lot of cloudy overcast days, you might not notice it right away. When the sun comes out, they tend to wilt. And you think, oh, wow, this is a very mature plant. They shouldn't be doing this in mid-season. Roots of club root, uh, infected plants. Um, they're swollen. They look kind of like um, like giant peanuts, and they have thick, irregular shapes. Now, the pathogens that cause this then release spores 
into the soil that can survive for 15 or 20 years. So if you find club root, if when you pull out your broccoli or, or your, your kale plant and you see this occurring, you want to avoid planting cabbage crops in an infected area of your garden for at least five to seven years. So how to prevent and control club root? This is really cool. Of course, crop rotation. This is all about crop rotation. And rotate your crops with marigolds. Now you thought this was all about veggies, but scientists are now learning more and more about uh, what really happens with companion planting, intercropping, and rotating crops. So according to soil tests conducted by the National Institutes of Health here in the U.S., they concluded that the crop rotation of Chinese cabbage, that's a member of the cabbage family, and they're just with marigolds, can significantly reduce the incidence of club root disease in the next crop, in the next crop that follows. I think that's so exciting because it means we don't have to submit to using chemicals. There are other ways in addition to just rotating your crops to rotating with something else that really attacks or deals with something specific. Okay, the carrot family, the APACA, this is parsnips and celery and dill, and they are also vulnerable to soil-borne diseases like carrot fly and celery leaf blight. And so again, crop rotation is important, crucial for disrupting the habitat for these pests and, and limiting the spread of the disease. And the gourd family. This is a biggie also. Cukes and squash and pumpkins and melons. Oh my. These are susceptible to pests like squash bugs and powdery mildew. Rotating these plants, again, helps interrupt that life cycle of pests and diseases. So you have less problem with the next crop, just future growing seasons. Now, all members of the gourd family are considered pretty heavy feeders that grow best in rich soil. Okay, are you ready? So we're gonna put this together, everything we just learned. So here's a crop rotation chart that I created from many of the things we just covered. It might look a little overwhelming, like, oh my gosh. But remember, when it comes to rotating your crops, there are no hard and fast rules. The most important thing is to do something to rotate your crops. It doesn't have to be perfect or exactly sequential or that kind of thing. So let's go through this. So looking at this chart, it's divided into four quadrants, squares, or groups. Now at first glance, the list of plants in each square might look a little confusing. But remember, we're taking into account two things, the families and the plants' nutritional needs. For example, in the pink square you see down there in the lower left, we have uh, celery. Now, celery, of course, is not in the brassica family, which is what most of the rest of those plants are. But celery is a heavy feeder, like broccoli and kale. So it's beneficial to put that in the group to follow what? Beans and peas, the nitrogen fixers. Now here's an example, a real life example of what you can accomplish by following the uh, beans and peas family which fix nitrogen in the soil with a heavy feeder like Brussels sprouts. So these are Brussels sprouts I harvested a few years ago. I didn't actually pull them off and harvest them. What I did was before the snow started or flew, before the, the snow flew, <laughs> I dug up the Brussels sprout plants and I placed each one in a five gallon bucket and topped it off with soil. And then I set them in the greenhouse. And we were able to continue harvesting for months in spite of freezing temperatures. 
But meanwhile, I could tend to the raised beds outside and prep them for the winter. Now back to our, our um, crop rotation chart. So let's look at another example. Now you might recall saying that we don't want to um, follow tomatoes with potatoes. That's why they're separated with a cycle between them. So here's tomatoes and across over here are potatoes. So as you rotate your crops, then there's gonna be a cycle in between. So they're not just following each other right away, the members of the nightshade family. Now you might be thinking, Marion, this is, this is all well and good if you've got plenty of raised beds or space to rotate your crops. But what if you have just one raised bed or two raised beds, or maybe you grow multiple things in a raised bed? This is what I deal with. I have uh, four by eight, four by 10 raised beds, and I've got multiple crops in here. I've got potatoes, I've got onions, um, I've got lettuce, more onions, and over here I've got onions and in the back, I've got some kale. So you can see they're all mixed up. So like I said, try to do the best you can. It might mean to actually just move them from place to place the next year. Sometimes what I do is I just draw a quick sketch and I just show the onions were here, the potatoes were there. And even if I just plant the potatoes in the next bed in an area, they might overlap the tomatoes a little bit, but the point is to actually just do what you can to rotate even a little bit. Uh, I have a friend who's got actually four raised beds and that's what she does. She goes, okay, one, two, three, four, like uh, what do you call it? Deck chairs or, or musical chairs. It's like musical chairs. Then the next, the next year, she just plants the potatoes in the next bed. Then it kind of shuffles around to the next one. So there are ways to do it. And I just follow the chart the best I can. And I, here's the trick, is I pay attention to any changes in plant behavior or characteristics, um, growth changes, or signs that might red flag that there's something that's wrong, you know, like club root or signs that things are going right. So, okay, many blessings, have a great one, and we'll see you soon and look forward to chatting with you.